Hi, I'm Lynn Siren. And, and I'm John Pinkus. We are going to talk about building diverse social networks. Net social networks, the software, not like the group of friends that you have. Um, and for someone to find diversity, diversity like this, I'm pretty sure Kronda already said this this morning, but diversity exists across a variety of dimensions. I keep seeing white women be synonymous, synonymous with diversity. Don't do that. Diversity is like non-neurotypical, trans, black, not American, people forget not English speaking is like a diverse group a lot. All of those things, right? And diversity needs to show from bottom to top. Um, I'm sure you've seen organizations where there are no black people in management, but it kind of has its roots in, well, we used to be a slave country. You know what was really diverse? Slave plantations. There were lots of me there. Um, well, that's not what we want to emulate, right? Like, I don't want a lot of black coworkers, but a lot of white bosses. That's not diversity, right? And diversity requires actively working towards your inclusion, not just letting people show up, letting the pipeline get really big. So, oh, black people just fall into our great organization, or women just fall into our great organization. Like, I don't know why. Women are joining tech more, but they don't exist more because people aren't actually trying to be inclusive of that group. You know, this is just a chart from, uh, I think, 2012, just showing uh, just one dimension of diversity, but the gender ratios on different social networks. And you can see that it spans a lot. This is US specific. Pinterest uh, in the UK is actually more male dominated as opposed to women dominated. At the bottom, you get the, uh, the, the, the techiest sites with the kinds of ratios you, you'd expect. But, you know, so you look at things like Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and, and demographically, there is a fair amount of diversity on these. There's broad enough adoption that they tend to come close to mirroring society. But when you look at the power structures, it's back to what Lynn was saying, that, that there's participation diversity, but not true the deeper diversity. You know, and, and, and the diversity on a site really is a product of a bunch of different factors. It starts with the initial demographics, the team that started it and the attention they pay to it, and then the outreach that they do. You know, if, if, if the initial team is a bunch of techie white guys and they ask their friends, well, now you've got a very intense skew and over time, the skews just become harder and harder to overcome. Quora is a great example of a site that started by targeting the techie elites of Silicon Valley, and guess what? Five years later, it's still a site for the techie elites of Silicon Valley. Um, then you've got the power vectors. Who's making the decisions? Who's profiting? Uh, who's the influentials on the site? If that's not representative, then, then what you have is uh, you may draw in some diverse people, but they won't stay around. Then a, a subtle point, easy to overlook, is the biases that the software itself introduces. Yeah, and the last part is that outreach is really important. A lot of people, they talk about diversity and then they don't do outreach. They're like, I would like more of these people, and then they don't follow these people, right? So shout out to all of the random tech CEOs that follow me on Twitter. I mostly post about like how gay I am, but they still follow me, so good for them. Like, <laughs> actually do that, right? Like if you can put up with me talking about like my cat ears all day, then like all of my friends are trans or black or like like really socialist, which is apparently like tech is really libertarian I hear. So, you know, like I bring all of that with me if people like can stand and do the outreach. So the, when you look at what the social, the key properties of a, of a social network that really, what encourages diversity and what goes against diversity. Now, all of these are on a scale. There's no absolutely right answer. There's no perfection on all of these. You can do better or worse. Um, it's a long list. These are possible. If you look at a site like, well, DreamWorth is the classic example that does all these things. It, it really starts with the attitude and the norms of the people who start the site, of, of the people who are there from the beginning. Is diversity something they care about? Yeah. Again, going back to Karanda's keynote, is it something that pe 
people care about more than to just say, I care about, but to actually do something about it. If you look at the work that Dreamwith put into, say, their diversity statement, which is very easy to find and everybody sees, calls out all these dimensions that Lynn was talking about, neurotypicals and not neurotypicals, all the different dimensions of diversity, and that's really central to the site's values, as opposed to, yeah, we'd like to be diverse, but, you know, whatever. The first step in, in going from this attitude to making things concrete is the community guidelines. The aid Initiative's done so much great work for community guidelines for conferences, it applies to uh, social networks as well, or really any online space as well. And so you see that some mailing lists, um, some online communities outside of the social network space have these strong guidelines and uh, you know, it's not enough to just have the guidelines. You've got to have meaningful processes behind these that that don't uh, that don't that don't that that make them real. Anything you want to say? Yeah, um, I, I think you have to have you have to actually enforce your guidelines. But you have to not over enforce your guidelines. I have a very specific thing that ha that happens all the time on Facebook, where all of my friends are trans. Like sixty percent of all of my friends aren't using their real name. 60% of all my friends can have someone just drop in and like real name report them and Facebook will pick them up and take them away, right? Like you have to, if you're gonna have community guidelines, make sure they're actually enforced, but like don't pull a Facebook where everyone's constantly like, is Facebook gonna ban me for X, Y, and Z because every, all of my friends are doing this same thing and no one really wants to like, no one at Facebook really wants to acknowledge that the fact that the way that they worry the community guidelines is like singling out whole groups of people that have to use their service. Like if you work at Facebook, you should take this feedback, but most people don't have a product that everyone in the world feels like they have to use, so. Exactly, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's mirroring society as a whole. If you make your, guide, your, your community policies so strong that everybody's in violation of one thing or another, then it becomes very much a matter of selective in, enforcement. Uh, you know, and, and this, the Facebook story ties to so many of these other issues. Pseudonymity and privacy, you know, superficially these don't immediately seem related to diversity, but what you have to ask is, well, who's harmed if a site doesn't have good privacy standards? If, if, they, it, you, it's, if they make it easy for, say, domestic violence survivors to be, uh, to be found by their, their abusers. It, these harms fall disproportionately on marginalized communities. There's a great page on the Geek Feminism Wiki, uh, who is harmed by a real names policy from the uh, Nim Wars on Google where they crack down on pseudonymity. And you know, lo and behold, two years later, Facebook does the same kind of crackdown. Nothing is learned here. Now this is actually an example where there are a lot of sites that, that are tolerant of pseudonymity. You can really single out Facebook as the, uh, the bad actor here. And more on the technology side, muting, blocking, reporting, you know, if you don't have the ability to shut up, you know, I just don't want to hear this anymore. Uh, again, it's, while it looks like a gender neutral, a uh, diversity neutral technology in practice, there's very strong power overtone guidelines here. I'd say that the biggest reason for that is because the farther you are from the normative, the normative like idea of a person in society, which is like boring white dude in his 20s working some like ADK job, as you move farther away from that, society just eats at you more and more. It's just like there's a passive drain on your mental health that happens as you move away from society's norm. You get more susceptible to someone saying something that can like eat at your mental health. That's what's great, this, this skew where like at the bottom end of people with privilege, it's really easy to just get, I can't deal with this, right? Because you are just being bombarded all the time passively. And then accessibility and internationalization. If, if, if you can't use the software, then, then you're not going to be able to participate in the community. And if you can't participate in your native language, you're a second class participant. Uh, you know, th th this is something in the internationalization is something that Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, do a pretty good job on. Google Plus, when they launched, uh, they really went uh, to a fair amount of work to make things accessible to screen readers. I don't mean to paint a bleak picture that no sites do this. Um, this is something that's very challenging for a lot of small open source projects to do from the beginning, because implementing is a challenge. Optional, flexible self-identification. Well, let's start with the optional. A lot of people 
don't want to say what their gender is. A lot of people do, or race, or orientation, or, 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 or. So sites like Facebook that say require gender and don't give an option for stating race, well, that's a pretty strong statement that's, that's um, very alienating to a lot of people. So it should be optional, and to the extent that you do want to specify it, you shouldn't have to just choose from a, from a pull-down list. Yes, longer pull-down lists are better than shorter pull-down lists. I mean, male, female, other is horrible. Uh, but, but still, you, know, you really want, there's, no matter what, what categories the person setting up the site or the team setting up the site has come up with, there's people who aren't going to fall into them. Let people identify however they want. Yeah, I, to have more about this specifically when I talk about Facebook, like you're not gonna ever. I don't okay. I don't want to say you're not gonna ever, but don't ever expect to any reasonable degree to create a drop down list, especially like race, gender, sexuality, etc. Like my friend was just talking about how they're um, demi kinky the other day. They just made up this word yesterday, right? It's demisexual plus kinky. They don't have sexual attraction to most people, but they do have like kink attraction to a lot of people, right? Like if you just made up this word yesterday, but it like the word parts describe an actual sexuality that happens for a lot of people, it's not going to be in anyone's drop down list anywhere, right? So don't expect that you're going to be able to create lists like that that actually describe people. Yeah, great example. Then user rights is you know this is really a hot button for me. If yeah. A few years ago, people were saying Facebook is the uh, largest country in the world. Yeah, and it's a country where the citizens, quote unquote, have no rights whatsoever. Um, you know, I chaired uh, the Computer Freedom and Privacy Conference a few years ago, and we put together a bill of rights for, for social network users. You know, you should have the right to, uh, it covers a lot of these things, things like pseudonymity, things like uh, optional self-identification, um, also things like due process or the right to delete my data and have it be re really disappear. Now, you can certainly argue about what specific rights are or aren't there. What's fascinating, though, is that on the large commercial sites, well, you know, you're not the, you're not the, you're not the uh, customer, you're the product, and so as product, you have no rights. And again, it comes back to diversity. This is good in the abstract, but when you tie it back to the power structures there and the norms, the farther, you people deviate, quote unquote, the, the more different people are than the cis white male uh, norms, the more you need the protection of meaningful processes for your rights. Inclusive processes, uh, you know, Kranda gave a great counter example this morning when she talked about Twitter, Twitter introducing uh, block lists. I mean, yay, yay block lists, but wait a second, why didn't they talk to any of the people who have been working on this, the people who you know, know better than anybody else what's needed, and the answer is, well, the answer is if you don't do that, you're going to be less, noticeably less hospitable to diversity. Ah, this is the part where I tear apart all of the social networks that you use every day. <laughs> Um, so Facebook's problem is that like I've seen it said in absolute sincerity that Facebook wants to like try to replace your government ID. That's what it feels like they're doing. They have a drop down list of about three or four things and they like sell, well it's not the selling part, but it's like they're shipping the fact that they have all of these identities on the site from these drop down lists, which is kind of what census data does. Like I have, I can think of so many parallels between the government and Facebook. And the government can't even get my real name right. Like, I don't expect Facebook to do these things right. I expect Facebook to actually do those things worse because Facebook almost has less reason to like, get my information right. The government has to track me. Facebook just has to sell me stuff. <laughs> so at, like, I, I just have so little faith in Facebook's ability to actually represent me. And the, the counterpoint of that is that Facebook accurately representing you and the way, the way you identify is almost a part of their terms of service, right? Like, I haven't seen anyone literally get banned for having a wrong race, location, or gender on their Facebook profile, but people get banned for names, right? And I just, I think that if people can, if you can get banned on Facebook for names, why aren't they also banning for gender? I feel like that's something that they would also do 
And I'm just glad that they actually have trans on there because I could imagine a world in which Facebook's like, actually, your legal gender is male, so you can't be on Facebook in this way. I can see it. Like, it's not something that you should ever try to do, ever. Don't try to, like, give drop downs, try to identify people, and, like, make it a part of your terms of service almost that, that people identify with these drop downs. It's honestly better when I can, like, Twitter Analytics, for example. Twitter Analytics obviously is trying to gender your followers to sell things to people, like gendered products to people, right? That I can tell from the way it's set up that that's why it's there. Right? And I almost respect that more than what Facebook does, where they're trying to like, classify the entire world. And wrong, too. Like, um, because of that first issue, like, you, you get a lot of, like, I have all, of my, all of my friends, like all of my really good marginalized friends on Facebook are all trans. Right? Like, a lot of us like, post lewd selfies, or we, like, we do some other sort of thing that could all get all of us banned off Facebook all at once, right? Like, there, this specifically happens on Facebook, and I can't think of smaller sites that do this, but if you, you can't, you re, I, like I've said this twice already, but you really can't create rules that a whole section of a community breaks unless you actually want them gone. I, and and like, you know, I'd also add that another, another good example is Facebook's rules on breastfeeding pictures. I mean, talk about excluding a large community and selectively enforcing it, of course. I, I see that, and I'm just like, okay, well then, you know, Facebook doesn't want moms on Facebook. Like, that's the only logical conclusion I can see from a rule about that. Like, and another issue with Facebook specifically is that they have, they have the best privacy tools of all of the social networks, but they, by and large, represent their privacy tools as a linear gradient. Like, there's acquaintance and friend and close friend, and that's the major privacy tool. The other, another privacy invisibility tool is like tied to your literal location, like your school or your city, and I wouldn't ever use that ever. That sounds even worse than like the close friends thing. But specifically, as like a queer person and a trans person, like my the way that I represent myself to people and like privacy stuff and visibility stuff is not linear with my like friendship or relationships like I, I don't I cannot conceive of a universe where my best friend is always the person who knows the most about me I can actually conceive of the opposite thing where the con the content or identity specific groups I have on Facebook like the trans group and the like queer group and a poly group those people that I don't know very well are actually the people who know the most about me, like, despite the fact that I have so little affiliation with them. And that's almost the exact opposite of how Facebook's pri privacy settings are set up. Twitter, Twitter did they just admit that they suck? I don't, like, I can't. I mean, I, that's a quote from their CEO. It's like yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how to drag Twitter. Twitter drags himself. <laughs> Oh, Sorry. I do have one good note about Twitter is that how easy it is to switch to a private account and how effective it is. Um, with, with most, like the way most software is set up, I would expect that if you want a private account, you have to set it up from the beginning and then you're private all the time and you just don't find anyone. Um, but Twitter private accounts are really effective at like, hey, you're getting piled on, switch to private, and then people, you just don't approve any follower requests for like a month. And it, it tones down the noise really well. Um, and I wish I knew more things that had a setting like that. Like it's, it's very similar to the um, OPI shields up thing in a way that like you can, you can just hide with this one tool. And Tumblr, Tumblr is like my favorite thing. Honestly, my only criticism of Tumblr is that I feel like they have really poor priorities. Like every six months, I feel like their mobile site gets better, or like their mobile CSS gets better. And it gets really good. Like you'll see later that my Quarrel that I'm working on, it looks like Tumblr, basically. Because I love Tumblr CSS. But like I feel like it took them, what, like two, three years of people like complaining about blocking specifically for them to add blocking. Like how many 
engineers you have at Tumblr. It, th it took you this long, and you like update your CSS like every three weeks. I, again, you know, I, I, th I, I think this is a great point. It's like you see, you see these large sites one after another doesn't pay attention to the blocking and muting. It's like Google Plus launched without it. Tumblr didn't pay attention to it for years. Twitter's stuff is laughable for years, um, and and it's. I still have things. What? I still have things for this one. Tumblr. What? I still have. My pro points for Tumblr. That was actually my only criticism. Tumblr is like my favorite network in terms of diversity, because I don't know. Like I don't know if no, I don't know. I am willing to bet that there is nothing about the specific technical structure of Tumblr that makes it so that it's the haven of like of like really young, really liberal people who like explore like every like. I feel like Miley Cyrus finding out that she's genderqueer. Like they're genderqueer. Why? How do they? How do they? Anyway, finding out that they're genderqueer like, had to have come from Tumblr. I don't see any other like, massive website where that sort of thing is growing. Like, every time I see people having conversations about, on, every single time I see people on Twitter having conversations about a specific term, a specific aspect of diversity and stuff that's really new and emerging, it's always come from Tumblr first, in my experience. Like, that's always the breeding ground for different kinds of identity expression. It's also the first place in basically the only place I see like coherently a lot of people having pronouns on their bio, a lot of people being like, hey, I'm cis, and these things, right? Like, only because I see that. And um, another cool thing about Tumblr is it's the, like, Xkit being so popular makes tum Tumblr a site that basically has content. People tagging so much and Xkit being so popular make Tumblr a site that's really good for content warnings. And like the only things I'm going to talk about about, about XK right now are like post blocking and content warning blocking, um, which is XK is a Tumblr extension, mind you. And post blocking on XK is like, I just don't want to see this really huge post about like, like the Charleston shooting that everyone is reblogging all the time, all the time. All right, you know about Charleston shooting. I did my advocacy. I don't want to see it anymore. It's reasonable. I don't see that as a feature on any other sites, but it's like widely known to be used on my Tumblr circles, right? Or I really don't want to see anything about like, like I as a black person don't want to see anything about racism for like a week. And I've done that, right? Like when I've, when I've had my feel of like learning how racist white people are in my country, I'll just blog racism for a little bit. And I know all of my friends tag racism because they're really good at that. That's the culture on Tumblr to like be really mindful about tagging things that like could offend people and like obviously it goes all the way over here where like people are like always tagging like specific foods when they eat them and I'm like okay but <laughs> by and large it's a really useful thing on Tumblr that like a lot of sort sites could choose to have and there was actually I believe there was a conversation recently about trigger warnings and the type of things that black activists post on Twitter and I'm like, yeah, if these same black activists were on Tumblr, they would be getting told constantly that they need to trigger war on racism, all of their stuff, and I would block it so I don't have to deal with it. But Tumblr is the only environment where that actually comes to like fruition. Oh, and yeah, and we can go on and we can critique all these other other sites. It's like it's it's too depressing. Um, you know, there's commonalities between all of them. Oh, yeah. Um, so basically, all, every site on the internet has a specific content filter for sex, specifically, because like, like boring rich people, under, like they only understand sex as the only content filtering commonality that people have. That's all that they know that a lot of people want to block, right? And I'm like, I would, I would much rather these people like have content blockings for like extreme racism or content blocking for like extreme homophobia or like ableism or stuff like that. But sex is the only thing that they know how to block and they don't give you the choice in blocking it. They'll just wipe all sexual content from their site or they'll make it like unsearchable or you have to have your entire account private if you want to have this thing, right? Like they're, they could extend these things to other, to other like, to other like aspects of things that can make people uncomfortable, but it's always sex and it's really frustrating and there's no choice. And it, it ties back to your point before that, that they just ban it as opposed to giving people the tools to protect themselves from, from what's, what, what's going on out there. 
right? And the fact that they just ban it and don't think about the fact that it could be a choice, it, it's what makes it so that there's no conversation about extending that to content warnings, right? Like, I am totally all for people like tagging sexual stuff, but like, I'm also for people tagging the other range of stuff, like all of the other things, the things that could be oppressive and could trigger me and all of those things. But I feel like people never put those two together. They're like, yeah, I don't want to see sex. But I'm like, I also don't want to see you talking about like the like hundred thousand dollar loan you just got. Like, these two things are equivalent in my mind. Um, another thing that I see happen a lot, that I see this specific thing happen, maybe once every three months. Um, two different communities, like, and I'm not, and I'm not talking about communities where one person is one side is clearly in the wrong. Um, I'm talking about communities where there is just a, a strong ideological difference that they usually have to work out. I see this with different subsets of trans people. I see this with di different subsets of liberalism, like socialists versus something, or binary trans feminine people versus something, um, where there's a, there's a dispute that is inherent to the two types of communities that are coming up against each other. And at some point, someone goes too far. But at that point, probably two or three other people have gone too far. But Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, et cetera, will pick one person out of that group that they feel like has just done way too much and pull them out. And that completely changes the tone of the discussion. And that's not, it, like, if you, if you don't think about it too hard, you're like, oh, yeah, they shouldn't have sold the other person that they were going to send all of these. No. They shouldn't have said that one thing, right? But it's ignoring the greater content of the discussion, and it ruins discussions a lot of times, because then the discussion becomes, oh, well, this person is being oppressed by the institution of, or the, the site that they're on and their, their organization, and not the actual merits of the conversation, right? And it's honestly not that this one person is wrong. It's more like there's a really huge rift in the community that could stand to be soothed a little bit. And honestly, the only tools that I see to working on this are things like Gamergate Autoblocker, <coughs> where it's just like this whole group of people, I don't want to listen to them. Don't want to listen to them. And so there's, there's, not, there's not that argument happening if all of your friends are all using Gamergate Autoblocker and there's no Gamergate people to come up into your mansions for you to argue with. There's less arguing total as a whole, right? And I'm working on the block bot, which is currently like a specific tool for a specific type of people. But, the, but I'm, in the next month or two, I'm going to change it so that it's for specific groups. So for example, there will be a, like a block list for fat phobia, and if there, or like a block list for TERFs. Or like a block, like there's going to be a block list for misandry, and I'm going to put myself on it because I do misandry sometimes. And like, if you don't want to hear misandry, then OK, good, block me. It's like, please, because I'm going to do it. Right, and I would just like you to not yell at me. <laughs> right. And then the last point here, you know, the, the last point, we, we, we debated about even putting this on the slide because it's just so obvious, but it, but it doesn't get said enough. It's like if you look at, at these, these large commercial social network sites, who, who's in charge? And then, then who's getting the wealth that's created? Puzzle Hunt is like a current hot, I'm sorry, a product hunt is a uh, current hot button for me that, you know, it's, it's to see the, the hot new products in Silicon Valley. And, and it's 90% you know, guys, overwhelmingly white, um, you know, just got $6.1 million of funding from a bunch of uh, white VCs who primarily invest in uh, guy companies. And, and where's the wealth that's getting created going from all these? Um, it's just something that they've all, all got in common. So, you know, it's not all it's not all uh, it's not all grim. Um, you know, again, I, I come back to dream with as as doing so many things right, explicitly promoting diversity. You know, excellent and very nuanced privacy controls. Um, it's it's diverse across the board. The processes are very inclusive. The work that DreamWith has gone to to uh, basically create an online hosted environment for new developers so that they can easily start using it, that's, that's amazingly inclusive and helps the process of getting people into the community, getting, once they're in the community, getting people deeper into the community. You know, this sets the bar for what can be done. And I don't think it's any accident that DreamWith is 
open source, whereas none of these other things that we've been talking about are open source, I think that fits in as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm putting on an economic hat, wow, there's an interesting market failure here. It's like, Dreamwith shows that it's possible. Tumblr shows how much a of a desire that people have for these kinds of communities where, where there is more, more diversity, more ability to be yourself. And, and why isn't any large venture-funded company making a run at it? Well, for the obvious reasons, but, but still, I think it really shows we can do better and, and people want to do better. So I think at this point we're going to go over, you know, pulling out what are some of the challenges to do better, and and how can we, uh, and, and and what ideas do we have? We've talked a lot, a lot about the uh, challenges in the uh, earlier case studies. So here's some solutions that relate to those. This is like the fourth time. Don't force people to identify with drop downs. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Um, if you have to do anything, have a, have like a have. Radio options plus text field. Like, don't do this drop down thing. It frustrates me. Um, oh, yeah, and uh, th this is specifically a Facebook thing. Avoid creating rules that marginalize an already marginalized community. Like, it, it, usually when people create these rules, they don't realize what they're doing. But be aware that the rules you implement could backfire and push away a group of people that you had no idea that you we're even pushing away. Um, and user control, content warning, content blocking is the thing of like, everyone blocks sex, but there's no choice and there's no option to block anything but sex, right? Like, do you think that there are other things that people would want to get rid of? Actually, I actually have a really good example. Um, there, are, there are like image filter things that like will block sexual content from being posted on your site. I would really like if there was like an image filter thing that detected if something was like, body horror or something and block that, right? Because I know people who see body horror and they will like just, they will dissociate for like three hours, right? But I haven't seen anyone like try to create an image searching solution for that. Um, the first one is be actively aware of your community differences. Like if you work at Twitter as, as a, one of the social teams, you have to be aware that this Gamergate thing is going on, right? Um, if you work at Tumblr, you really have, if you work at Tumblr and you're like one of the moderation people, you have to be aware at how the different social justice communities interact with each other and how that affects their language and how they talk to each other and all that stuff. Because you have to know when someone actually comes out of, goes out of line, right? You can't just be like, you can't just get a solo report of someone who said this one thing with, like, while ignoring the greater realm of things. And I have another example actually, which is, like if, if I have a really aggressive response to someone like neo-Nazi Twitter in response to Charleston shooting, and like Twitter bans me because my response is really aggressive, a bunch of black people just got shot in a church. Of course I'm going to be aggressive. Like you have to be aware of the greater field of these communities and what they're dealing with. And the last thing is always think about privacy and visibility non-linearly. I have a hard time with this. It's a hard thing to implement for me personally, working on my social network, but never, never assume that a linear gradient of privacy options is gonna be the best option. Like, it's usually the easiest option, but never assume that it's the best option because a lot of people have like best friends that they can't tell this one thing, and if the, the network doesn't allow for that, then they just won't talk about it. It just won't be a thing that they can express and they can't be themselves in that particular way. And then, then some more challenges and possible solutions. One of the things I've discovered uh, doing, uh, trying to work on a social network is people want a lot of functionality. Um, you know, if I want, I want journaling, I want communities, I also want status updates, and I want to share photos, and I want to I want collaborative editing, and and um, and, you, and I want chat, and the list goes on. And wow, that's that's a real challenge. So, can we can we improve things by federating different services that provide some of these things, or 
at the at, at the very least cooperation between the services. You know, Dreamwidth federates with a live journal. It's one of the few examples out there where there's actually some kind of federation going on. Are there more of these things we can do? Um, and people aren't most people I talk to aren't willing to fully get off Facebook because they've got relatives there, because they've got school friends there. There, there are some people, but, but a lot of people want to keep a toehold there. And so, so you need to coexist with that in some sense. IndieWeb has some very interesting ideas here. Basically, at least for public posts, being able to syndicate them out from your site or social network to Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, and even being able to bring responses back. So I think there's something to learn there. There, there is some good WordPress plugins for that, that provide this as well. A lot of the existing open source infrastructure has usability issues or is limited with accessibility or internationalization or questionable security. So that means that if you, if you want to just sort of set something up uh, from scratch, your choices at this point are well, BuddyPress. Um, Denise, is there anybody running their own instance of Dreamwidth code? There are a couple of them. They're small, but they're very uh -huh. Okay, so, so the, the, there's, there's a few examples out here. Both of these are, are old, you know, relatively old code bases that have been, have been brought forward over time. You know, does it make sense to think about developing a new platform? Things that would have, you know, designed from the beginning by a team that values diversity, trying to design in, oh, what does it look like if we've got good muting and blocking from the beginning? What does it look like if we've got content warnings and the ability to filter them from the beginning? Um, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. And then, there, then of course, there's the, the, the economics. Um, you know, if, if, if you do something that reinforces oppression, you can get millions of dollars funding dumped on you. If you're doing something that tries to counter that, well, you can't. And yet, and yet, there's a lot of people out there who value stuff like this. And it's not only people who explicitly value diversity that, um, that will look to a diverse platform. Is it possible to have the same kind of ecosystem approach that WordPress has used so successfully? Is it possible to build a similar ecosystem on top of, on top of a, a new diverse platform? Uh, I say that because, yes, I think it is. I think that's an interesting path to go down. And I think if we can do that, then you can possibly create enough of a virtuous cycle that you've got people working on this who will take things forward. Uh, before we go on to the wrap up, Denise, is, is there anything, I mean, you know this stuff better than anybody else. Is there anything, is there anything else you'd add about like key solutions or problems? Indeed, you know, on, on Tapestry Maker, I completely adopted the diversity statement. Uh, no change is necessary. It's, it's powerful. If you haven't read it, read it. I was talking about a different economics. Um, so, like, a lot of people are, I know a lot of people are really skeptical about their ability to build alternative products. A lot of diverse people are really skeptical about their ability to build alternative products when like a lot of these startups are getting like five million dollars and they've only made like 10k a year. Um, like I'm like and you're like well if clearly it takes five million dollars to build Elo and I only make 10k then I could never build Elo. Well actually, um, especially like this isn't this isn't a message to like CEOs. This is more a message to like activists and like ground level people. If you get, when you get marginalized people who really, really want to get something done and they're really driven, it, it, we aren't talking about like $5 billion to build Elo. We're talking about like it took me 20K over the course of the, over the, course of the entire time that I've been working on Quirrell. And it's like almost feature complete for a basic network, right? Because that's just how I like to work. This is who I am. Like I'm a really big activist. I want to get things done, right? And I'm not like alone in that. There are a lot of like really marginalized people who like if they had 5K, they could make something much better than every, than all of the things on Product Hunt, right? And it's not something that you need to throw hundreds of millions of dollars at. 
And that's why I want to shout out to Ashes Fun Club, because it does exactly that thing. Like, just take a few thousand dollars, give it to someone who can get something really amazing done for a few thousand dollars, and you just run away with it. It's amazing. It's a great point. I mean, it's, it's challenging to build a site that scales to 100 million people. But when you're starting out, you don't need to scale to 100 million people. You need to scale to enough people to get things going. But the, you know, this makes a great transition to our, our last couple slides, just talking about what, what we're doing. Yeah, I'm working on Coral, and the, the basis for Coral is that the closest, the closest approximation to a network where I can, where I can display a wide range of relationships and a, like my nuanced relationships that I have like as a queer, poly, trans person is Facebook because Facebook has the best fine grain relationship options of all the big networks, right? And like all p queer, poly, trans is not what works with Facebook. I can't, I can, I can only just recently express being like queer and trans on Facebook with their new like gender things. And I've def there's definitely no poly support or video support on Facebook on Facebook, it just isn't, right? And that was the first idea that I had, like, oh, there's like a market here for people with really nuanced and different relationships to have a network of their own, and like not, not somewhere that you, that you like use all the time and it's your primary thing, but really somewhere to like escape to when like people are doing too much on Twitter. Or like Facebook is like sending you a message about this thing about your account is wrong and you don't want to deal with that, right? You go to like the smaller network that is has that is a closer approximation of your more complicated relationships and how you feel emotionally about the people around you on the internet. And then um, I'm working on Tapestry Maker, which is a uh, uh, a, a platform for uh, for running social networks, and you know some of the things here. One of the things we didn't talk a lot about is customizability. It's like people like a site that looks different. I mean, I personally, I'm so sick of blue. Uh, uh, but you know, if the, the, these are actually my colors, other people might not like these colors so much. And so you know, we've got extreme customizability, even down to the font. I believe we're the only uh, social network that can run in Comic Sans, if you, if you like. And, and you know, it, it comes down to, well, what, what do you talk about? If you get a bunch of people who value diversity, we've got discussion groups. One of our most popular discussion groups is diversity. And you know, there's others like what's new, there's politics, science, we're a lot of, a lot of geeks there. But, uh, um, we chat individual, site-wide, you know, group chats are a really great way of hanging out. Our, with our group chat, you can pipe in streams of music. So we have weekly socials where we, one week it's 80s, next week it's Psytrance. And things like tarot card readings. Um, you know, and w when I look at who, who would adopt this, well, one of the possibilities is you find um, communities that are not having their needs met by other social networks and the tarot community is actually an interesting one in that there's a lot of people out there they don't have any options so after I leave this conference I'm going to the uh, tarot convention in Denver uh, to, um, to, to to hear what people have to say you know I, I, let me see if this, this works out also things like ties back to what I was saying about embedding um, embedding this is this is what the uh, chat a group chat looks like, but you can embed a Twitter feed. Yikes. Save. Oh, not so. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So, right, you can see the, gr the uh, group chat, the Twitter feed, there's a chat here. Um, we had some people following along. I, I had the slides embedded so that people can follow the slides. You know, it's, it's an early state. As I say, it's, it's challenging to see how much functionality people really want in a social network, but it's also the kind of thing I've basically put this together with myself with a couple of uh, a couple friends doing things part-time, so gonna be looking for more people. And I think that's pretty much what, what we had to cover. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for listening. Questions?